I was six years old when I first enrolled in a U.S. school in the Rio Grande Valley. The classroom set up at my new school was different than the one I attended in Mexico. The truth is, everything I once knew was different. Instead of sitting in groups around a table, we sat in rows and individual desks. All of the adults and most of the kids at my new school spoke English. The few kids that spoke Spanish either whispered or said nothing most of the day. We began each day by pledging allegiance to a flag I didn't recognize. Kids in my new school placed their hand flat over their heart instead of a military-style salute across their chest the way I had previously been taught. The teacher led the class from the front of the room, and I could not comprehend a single word. I spent most of my day looking feverishly around the classroom, trying to read body language, trying to keep up with my classmates. Even the alphabet above the blackboard in the front of the room was different. It was missing letters. Mama explained that Papa had taken a job in the shrimping industry and that we would be leaving our home in Mexico and moving al otro lado. On the other side, part of the vernacular in the region that no one had to explain to you, it referred to the border community on the other side of the river in the United States. She gave my siblings and me a crash course in English and taught us the few words she knew. In reality, there was little she could have done to prepare us for what we were about to experience. Although I previously excelled at school, I was now struggling in the classroom. Our teacher placed us into groups according to our reading ability. I was either a red bird or a green bird. I know with certainty that I was not a blue bird. Those blue birds could read English fluently, and I, I was reading every letter phonetically. I was sounding everything out using the phonetic approach that Maestra Raquel in Mexico had taught me. But my spoken word had no meaning. We spoke Spanish at home, but we could not do so at school, at least not around our teachers. Every year, teachers at my elementary school were more adamant about not allowing us to speak Spanish. On occasion, speaking Spanish in the presence of our teachers resulted in corporal punishment. I remember a time when a teacher placed a ruler on the back of my hand. She lifted it and swatted it down to strike me. Another teacher taught me a lesson using the Webster's Dictionary. She had me hold one on each hand and raise my arms up away from my body for what seemed like an eternity. I was being punished for speaking the language that I knew to be the language of poetry and the arts. It was the language of my abuelos, the language of my padres. I did not understand. Our teachers wanted us to speak English instead of Spanish. But as the month of February drew near, we were highly encouraged to participate in the Charo Days festivities, an annual celebration of the Mexican heritage and the relationship that exists between the people on the Mexican and the American sides of the Rio Grande. Things were strange at home also. Our parents knew we were learning to speak English at school. Still, when my siblings and I reached a conversational proficiency level, we were scolded for doing so. At the Salazar household, speaking English in the presence of those who did not understand it was considered ill-mannered. En esta casa van a hablar español. ¿Qué falta de respeto es ese? ¿Cómo van a estar hablando inglés en la presencia de sus padres y sus abuelos? In this household, you will speak Spanish. What lack of respect is that? How can you speak English in the presence of your parents and your grandparents? It was as though we were living a double life. I did not feel deeply rooted in either culture for a long time. Circumstances were forcing us to develop what Ansaldúa referred to as the mestiza-like consciousness. Circumstances warranted going in and out of both cultures and between languages. I was living in a state of Nepantla a term in the indigenous Aztec dialect of Nahuatl that captures an existence involving an in-between state of consciousness. Looking back, I can see that I was struggling to find my cultural identity. How could I feel this way? How could my blood still boil when I heard Mexico's national anthem? How could my blood boil when I heard my mama sing along to mariachi music that played on Spanish television or radio stations? How could I feel this way when I was pledging allegiance to a new flag? 
Who was I? The state of confusion and shame grew deeper as time went on. Everything rooted in culture and citizenship was contingent on a situation or location. I was nothing more than an academic tourist in the borderlands of culture. By the time I got to middle school, teachers were no longer as concerned about students speaking Spanish. Still, there was something rather ironic about the entire middle school experience. I had reached this whole new level of proficiency in English, and now the school curriculum required that I take Spanish as a foreign language. Through my undergraduate work, I learned that when we set out to shape the academic experience for immigrant students, we cannot simply concern ourselves with the cognitive and the linguistic domains. We must also address the affective domain, that portion of our lessons or academic experience that teach students an appreciation and a validation of the self. In our efforts to help students assimilate into the mainstream culture, we are erasing the richness of their heritage and weakening the fiber of the fabrics that make our nation stronger. It is in this domain where schools are failing to capitalize on the one of the most valuable resources we have, the culture of our students. Almost 21 million elementary and secondary students of immigrant families were enrolled in the nation's public schools in October of 2016, representing 26% of the overall student population. I trust that no one is using rulers or the Webster's Dictionary in the way that I experienced. I fear, however, that there may still be schools out there sustaining learning environments that allow shame and doubt to creep into the lives of our students. Our ability to help immigrant students succeed necessitates leaders with the courage to create spaces in which students can feel comfortable participating in activities that validate their heritage and their culture. Today, these spaces exist in schools throughout the Rio Grande Valley. One such space was created by one of our principals. This space exists in the performance portion of pep rallies ahead of our football games. Having nearly 2,000 students in the gymnasium at one time is every high school principal's nightmare. Allowing kids to come down to the floor to dance along to conjunto or mariachi music that is being played by their classmates and then return to their seats for the introduction of the offense and the defense takes courage and is rather unique. Thanks to one of our teachers, an activity that was once an after-school club is now a popular course offering in our high school. I'm referring to folklorico or folkloric ballet, a collective term for traditional Mexican dances that emphasize the folk culture of different regions. The pictures, the smiles on the faces of kids tell it all. Can you see the pride with which they perform? These clubs are now available at almost every one of our elementary schools. When teachers sponsor these clubs or teach the class, they are creating spaces and addressing the effective domain. When teachers share the similarities between their culture and the culture of our students, they are achieving cultural congruence and reaching a whole new relationship with kids. If I could speak to my five-year-old self, I would choose to do so during one of the many evenings that I spent sitting on the tailgate of my grandfather's yellow and white 71 short bed Chevy. I distinctly remember sitting on this tailgate, swinging my legs back and forth, trying to stay in sync with my grandfather as he would sway his legs while listening to the evening news on a transistor radio. My grandfather was a sorghum farmer, and to him, this Chevy pickup was a way of transporting sorghum and seed to the ranch. But to me, it was a classroom. It was here where he and I spent many memorable moments. He had a unique way of telling stories. He told me about his journey and how he and his family traveled into the United States to work the fields and pick the cotton. He told me of his struggles and his experiences. And it was here where he told me how blessed we were to live under the shade of this great oak known as the United States. It was through these moments and these stories that I gained the values and morals that began to shape my character. I would pick this precise moment to tell my five-year-old self that I too would have a journey and struggles and that through these experiences, I would be afforded opportunity. I would encourage my five-year-old self 
to stay the course and to absorb everything I was about to experience because one day I too would join the ranks of the many passionate educators in the Rio Grande Valley and that I would draw on my lived experience to shape the world and make it a better place for children just like me.